Good evening. I'm Reardon Rowett, the director of the Latin American Studies Program. Welcome to our panel on the year of elections in Brazil, expectations and potential pitfalls. We thought a long time before we uh, added the last phrase uh, to the title of the event, but there are pitfalls out there which we'll discuss tonight. I'm also very delighted to welcome uh, our attendees, our alumni, SAI students, as well as pers prospective SAI students, both here in the hall with us and viewing the webcast. Uh, I will speak first on some of the political issues that we confront, uh, then Dr. Monica de Bull on my immediate right, uh, who is at the Peterson Institute of International Affairs uh, and also an adjunct professor at SAIS for a couple of years, will delve into some of the really difficult uh, e fiscal and economic questions. And our third speaker will be, uh, no, actually my, our second speaker will be Cornelius yeah. Weisshaker, <laughs> who has just been a lead, one of the lead economists on this new report that is out today or yesterday. Today in English. Today in English. <laughs> a, a, a fair adjustment. A fair adjustment. Efficiency and equity of public spending uh, in Brazil. In Cornelius at the World Bank and a member of the Young Professionals Program. Uh, and this, I think, will be an interesting panel. I have some four questions I'll pose to start the evening off. Uh, the first is, why didn't Brazil pass the fiscal reform uh, that was so needed uh, after e months and months of debate? and also, of course, being downgraded by S&P uh, and Fish. Uh, pensions and Social Security are, costs are expanding. Uh, the deficit is a very dangerous issue politically as well as economically, and that's a very important issue for the new government coming in in 2019, and perhaps uh, Dr. DeBole or Cornelius will have some ideas of whether the new government is going to be any more successful than the present government of Michel uh, Temer. The second and the most pressing question uh, is really one word, Lula. Uh, is Lula going to be a candidate or not? Uh, two courts have now negative, uh, taken a negative position on Lula. Uh, he's been turned down for habeas corpus. He can appeal to one more court, uh, but under Brazilian law, uh, he's also sus uh, sus susceptible to be going to jail uh, in a few weeks. That is a very difficult and important question. What will the reaction of the PT militants be if indeed Lula is jailed? Uh, he is a hero to a large part of the Brazilian population, not a majority of the population, but a large part of the Brazilian population. Uh, and that is a very important question uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, the demonstrators of the PT have been uh, active outside the courtroom. Uh, they've made it clear that they don't believe this is a fair process. Uh, and there is a sense in Brazil among the PT and others that this is really the decision by the elite in Latin America or in Brazil uh, to basically foreclose the presidency a third term uh, for Lula. Uh, and you hear that a great deal in the comments made by the PT. Leading politicians have actually said, including the president and former president Cardozo, better Lula's defeated at the polls uh, than in the courts. Right now it looks as though he's going to be defeated uh, in the courts, and that is very important. Uh, if not Lula, who? Uh, the leading candidate in many ways, uh, long-term establishment, and right now the mood in Brazil is anti-establishment, uh, is the governor of Sao Paulo, Mr. Alcamin, who just spoke uh, in Washington a day or two ago, uh, from the Social Democratic Party. Uh, he's behind in the polls. Uh, and if Lula is left out of the polling, uh, the two next most important polled characters uh, in Brazil uh, are first Jair Bolsonaro. Mr. Bolsonaro is a very colorful and interesting person on the far right of the political spectrum. Uh, he's a former army paratrooper. Uh, he voted for the impeachment of former President Dilma Rousseff. Uh, and from the floor of the Congress, he said that uh, his vote was dedicated to an army colonel who ran an infamous torture center during the military years. And indeed, President Dilma Rousseff was tortured at that torture center uh, during the military years. Uh, most importantly, he claimed that the 1964-1985 dictatorship uh, was not a dictatorship. Uh, that stirs up certain memories for certain people in Brazil on the left and on the right as well. Uh, the second person, as usual, uh, in many ways, is Marina Silva, uh, who ran twice before for the presidency in 2010. Uh, she received about 19.3% of the popular vote, and in 2014, 21% of the popular vote. Uh, she has a very strong constituency uh, among the environmentalists, among students, uh, and that, I think, has always carried her uh, over the 15 18% mark. Not clear these will remain the numbers as we move towards uh, the election in the first round of the election in October. Uh, there are two other uh, possible wild cards. One is a TV personality, Luciano Hook, 
who has said yes, has said no, he said yes, he said maybe, I don't know, well, let's see, I'll make decide later on. Um, and uh, the other one is just a former Supreme Court Justice Joaquin Barbosa, uh, who is an Afro-Brazilian, a very distinguished jurist who has not yet made a decision, uh, but he would be a very interesting candidate if he decided uh, to do so. The third question is, will the new government, no matter who wins in October or the second round in November, uh, be able to govern any better than the current administration? That's a very big question for many Brazilians. The mood in Brazil is very angry. It's angry about the economic recession. It's angry about constant charges of corruption against public and private officials. It is angry because of the overrun on costs for the Olympics and for the World Cup, uh, when that money, many say, should have been spent on hospitals and on schools uh, and on infrastructure. Brazilian infrastructure, physical infrastructure, uh, is among the worst in the developing world. Uh, and that also, of course, is a very important question in terms of exports, uh, in terms of integrating the country. Uh, and anyone who's tried to drive in Brazil recently uh, understands uh, the pothole challenge uh, of going anywhere uh, in Brazil. Uh, and what's interesting is that Mr. Bolsonaro <clears throat> has been a member of nine political parties in his political career. Uh, he is a nationalist, conservative, and anti-left. And the problem of governing in 2019 uh, is really a very challenging one. Uh, the Senate of Brazil is 81 members, uh, and there are six parties represented in the Senate. Uh, the House of Representatives uh, has a 513 federal deputies. There are 26 political parties represented in the lower house of the Congress. You see the challenge of any president attempting to pass any legislation. You've got to build coalitions on a daily basis. Lula was superb at doing that, or at least his people were superb at doing that, from 2002 to 2010. Jill Rousseff uh, was a bad politician and wasn't able to build those coalitions. The question is, no matter who wins, if I, and as Lula said, God is a Brazilian, so there may be divine intervention, and Lula may indeed be able to be a candidate in October. Increasingly, the polls don't think so, uh, and analysis, anal analysts don't think so either. Uh, so the issue then will be to try to build a very disparate uh, coalition starting all over again, because many deputies and senators will not return. There'll be new faces who need to be convinced that they should vote against their political interests by cutting back on the Social Security and the retirement benefits of public sector workers who are extraordinarily well organized and they turn out to vote in large numbers. Uh, and the buildup of that pension system has, was over decades. And undoing that entitlement for so many people in Brazil <clears throat> is an amazing public challenge. Uh, and the fourth question, uh, and this is a very important one, uh, what we've seen in the last two years, three years, uh, is that federal prosecutors in Brazil uh, read the Constitution and they suddenly found out they were independent. And they began to prosecute. And they began putting people in jail. They began using the plea bargain. Tell me what you know, and I'll give you less time in jail. And that's been quite brilliant, and it's worked very well with the Judge Morrow and his colleagues. And the real question is whether or not that will change with the new government, or whether or not it will become so deeply embedded in the political culture of Brazil uh, that Brazilians will now give a great deal of support uh, to the idea of independent prosecutors who are able to find out uh, where and follow the money trail, uh, as we should do in this country with some of our politicians, uh, and find out precisely where the irresponsibility was and can it be corrected. And that, I think, is a major challenge uh, for Brazil in the next couple of years. And so we're at the cusp of uh, the national election. It's a very important national election. Other candidates may come forward, although there are not many names. Ciro Gomez, who's been around forever, uh, senator, congressman, governor, mayor, um, has indicated he probably will run. Uh, there's Marina Silva, the environmentalist, uh, and there's the wild card of uh, Justice Barbosa and the TV Global, Luciano Hook. But the polls all through the last month or two have made it very clear that if Lula does not run, Jair Bolsonaro uh, is the front runner and will probably be able to make it into the second round. Uh, and some are arguing it will be Jair Bolsonaro against Marina Silva uh, in the second round. But we're still very far uh, from the elections uh, in October for the first round, and everyone assumes that there is going to be uh, a second round. Uh, and many people, I think, in Brazil will vote uh, on the corruption issue. Uh, there are constant comments uh, about why the politicians, and so many of them, are corrupt. Why aren't they responsible? Why can't they separate their private interests from their public responsibilities? And that is not just an issue in Brazil, it's an issue in many countries around the world, but it's becoming increasingly 
important in Brazil, as Brazilians understand, again, we're a wealthy country, uh, but why isn't the wealth being spent on issues and topics that really are very important to me and to my family? That, I think, will drive many of the votes uh, in Brazil. Cornelius, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Dr. Rett, um, and thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to be uh, back here at SAIS and, of course, uh, to talk about Brazil. Um, I'm neither a Brazilian citizen nor a political analyst, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, two things. Um, one, the economic context um, in which this election is scheduled to take place later this year, um, and then also a little bit about the um, fundamental fiscal challenge that Brazil is uh, facing. Um, so, on the economy, um, there's actually some good news, um, maybe uh, the, the only good news we'll hear tonight. Um, the good news is essentially that um, it rained just about the right amount last year, which meant that the agriculture sector was growing based on a very strong soy and, and grain harvest. Um, so we actually had uh, GDP growth last year for the first time in a couple of years, um, 1%, but you know, better than nothing. Um, and all joking about the rain aside, um, there was a much more broad-based turnaround in the economy, um, especially by the second half of the year. We saw growth in um, private consumption, investment was starting to come back, uh, manufacturing grew again. So it's quite clear that we are now in a recovery. Um, and this is expected to continue and, and sort of gain a little bit of traction um, this year. Um, we've even seen um, formal job creation pick up again. Um, in the last couple months, so unemployment, which is around 12% right now, is you know can be expected to to decline at least gradually um, over the year. Um, so just to recap a little bit what what has happened on the economy, um, we've had a, a horrible recession in the last um, two years, essentially you know ever since the the 2014 election. Um, so GDP declined by a total of about 7%. Um, and there was a very disruptive and painful adjustment that, that happened, you know, mostly in 2015 with um, regulated prices had to be adjusted. That led to a spike in inflation, which led to high interest rates, which then sort of drove the economy into, into recession. Um, obviously, commodity prices didn't help at that time either. Um, so this whole cycle has turned. Um, inflation is now actually below target. Um, the central bank has cut interest rates to a level that, you know, we haven't actually seen before. Um, so confidence returned um, over a year ago, um, which you know, also coincided with the change in the, in the government after the uh, impeachment process. Um, the current government is sort of seen as, as broadly business friendly, um, less um, meddling in the, in the private sector affairs than, than the previous government. Um, there seems to be quite a bit of, of sort of confidence or credibility even for, the, for fiscal policy. If we look at the, you know, the bond yields and those sorts of things, which is a bit surprising given that there actually hasn't been any sort of real positive development on fiscal results. Um, and of course, the global environment is also helping. Uh, we still have ample liquidity. Commodity prices are, are in a somewhat better place than they were a year or two ago. Um, so what's going to happen with the Brazilian economy in the this year, next year? Well, I think growth is definitely picking up. Um, there is some um, forecasters already seeing three or even up to four percent for this year, next year. Um, I don't know if it's going to be quite that much, but it's clear that given where we are with this horrible recession behind us, um, you know, just putting all those unemployed people to work will allow for higher growth at least for a year or two, um, potentially. Um, but of course, more structurally, it's not like, like anything has really changed for the Brazilian economy um, too much, right? Um, we still have the, the perpetual problem of Brazil, which is uh, low savings and low investments. Um, investment has fallen to just over 15% of GDP. Um, we still have a little bit of a current account deficit. Um, so for those of you who paid attention in the monetary class, um, it means that investment, uh, sorry, that savings is even lower than investment, um, which has sort of been the, the Achilles heel of the Brazilian economy for really decades. Um, the current government, given that they've only been in power for you know, a little over a year, um, year and a half, so they've actually made some progress. Um, there was a labor reform. Um, there's been some reforms to um, the way that public banks allocate credit, um, especially the, the interest rate that's used by the um, development bank, Benediesi. Um, so there's some, you know, there's some movement for a government that's really, you know, didn't have um, much to work with. Um, but of course, the really big 
structural challenges, which are most, which are mostly in the fiscal area, um, have not been resolved. Um, Professor Wright mentioned the, the pension reform, which was the, the one big reform that the government was trying to accomplish and, and ultimately um, failed um, last month. Um, so this kind of brings me to the the whole issue of the, the fiscal problem. And um, Professor Red already um, graciously acknowledged our, our report, the uh, um, fair adjustment. Um, it sounded better in Portuguese, uh, ajuste justo. Um, um, so I just want to quote the, the opening line of the report, which is, the Brazilian government spends a lot more than the country can afford, and on top of this, spends poorly. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the real problem we're in here. Um, so why does it spend too much? Well, the fiscal deficit even last year when the economy started to recover and then, you know, fiscal, the fiscal accounts had some one-off um, um, upsides um, was still almost 8% of GDP. Um, debt has grown to about 75% of GDP. So clearly that, that trend is um, structurally unsustainable. What the government did um, already at the end of 2016 is that they imposed themselves an expenditure rule, um, which essentially says that the, the non-interest expenditures of the government cannot grow faster than inflation. Um, the problem is that um, while this is in principle sufficient to have sort of a gradual fiscal adjustment, you know, you keep expenditures uh, fixed in real terms and then revenue is going to grow, you know, if or when the economy grows, um, there really isn't a plan to prioritize and, and cut the spending under the ceiling, um, which will be required, um, given that there is things like, like social security that are, are bound to grow unless they're being reformed. Um, so really, the way this expenditure ceiling you know, works, you know, according to some analogies, is you, know, you, you want to lose weight, so you buy a tighter suit, and then you hope you eventually you're going to fit into it. But, if you don't change your diet, it's probably not going to happen. Um, so why does the Brazilian government spend poorly? Um, well, so first of all, it's important to remember always that in Brazil, actually, the government spends a lot. Um, in it's, you know, 30, about 38% of GDP in government expenditure, much more than in, in most other countries in the region. Um, but at the same time, it seems that the, the public services um, are not reflecting that. Um, the quality of, of health and education is not particularly good given how much money is being spent on that. Um, Professor Red mentioned the, the infrastructure problem, which um, has only gotten worse because investment in infrastructure is sort of the one thing that governments have been able to cut over the last couple of years. Um, the biggest spending item is, is pensions. Um, Brazil already spends about 13% of GDP on various pension schemes, um, which is more than, than countries like Japan spend. And, you know, everybody knows Japan is a very old country. Brazil, not yet. So Brazil will have to spend a lot more just given the demographics um, if, if nothing is done. Um, there is other programs on the, the labor and social side um, where Brazil has some very efficient social programs, like the famous Bolsa Familia program, but it also has other programs that actually cost significantly more, but are, are very poorly targeted. Um, and then there is the issue of public um, payroll. Um, in the report, we estimate that the federal government um, employees, um, civil servants, um, make about two-thirds more than a, somebody in the private sector with comparable skills in a comparable position. Um, so, if you ever have a chance to get a federal government job in Brazil, I guess take it. Um, but um, obviously, this is something that the, the country cannot afford. Um, and then on top of that, the pension system for people who've worked in the, in the private sector, so Social Security essentially, is, is quite generous. Um, but the pension system for government workers is a lot more generous still. Um, I've been working a lot with um, state and, and local governments in Brazil, and you know, the the way people retire and the benefits they receive, it's, it's quite outlandish. Um, and basically what this has resulted in is that there's already a number of, of, of especially state governments in Brazil that are in some form of, of slow walking uh, bankruptcy. Um, the most famous being Rio de Janeiro State, um, which essentially has been, has been bankrupt for, for two years. And of course it's not a coincidence that Rio de Janeiro is also the place where the, the problem of public security and violence has become the worst, and now the, you know, the federal government has sent in the army to, to try to address it. Um, so 
To wrap the fiscal question up a little bit, clearly this is an area where reform is needed urgently and you know, it has to be pretty far-reaching reform. Um, and obviously those things are, are politically very, very different and you'll have to um, deal with a lot of vested interests and, you know, and then essentially um, yeah, go, go after people's money in some way. Um, um, I also wanted to quickly mention the revenue side. Um, the thing on the, with taxes in Brazil is that Brazil is pretty good at raising money. Um, it raises around 30% of GDP. Um, which is, again, a lot more than other countries in the region. Um, but the tax system of Brazil is sort of notoriously um, inefficient, distortionary. It's also quite regressive. Um, just to give you an idea, every state in Brazil has their own value-added tax on goods and services. So if you're trying to um, ship as a business, ship your goods or source goods from other states within the country, that's a, a bureaucratic nightmare. Um, so. Tax reform is clearly something that, that should be happening. It should have been happening for the last 20 years. Um, it hasn't happened because it involves a lot of uh, important stakeholders, um, not just at the federal level and Congress, but also the states, which have this large stake, and obviously the private sector. Um, so looking a little bit at the election, um, I guess what one could hope for is that, well, the election um, delivers a new president who comes in with a mandate to undertake um, all those reforms and you know, is able to uh, bring them through Congress, which in the case of pension reform, the, the current government has not been able to do. Um, I'm somewhat skeptical that about that. Um, the, the problem I see is that right now as it shapes up, the election you know, seems to be to a large extent about other topics. Um, obviously, the economy is, is always going to play a role, but you know, security is a big topic, corruption is a big topic. So I'm not so um, optimistic that we're going to see a lot of sort of serious, um, well thought out debate in the election about uh, these economic challenges. Um, candidates tend to like to rather promise to spend more rather than less, um, even though in, in the current Brazilian context, I mean, it's not, it doesn't seem very credible. Um, so, you know, what you would expect is a lot of platitudes, oh, we're going to protect people's rights and we're going to cut uh, the privileges of some vague uh, other group. Um, of course, people always tend to perceive their own privileges as their rights that, that they want to have protected. So I think that's going to be a challenge that um, whoever wins the election this year is going to have to face with. And President Wall. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Roet. Thank you, Cornelius, for that very far-reaching <laughs> overview of, of Brazil and, and the challenges that the, that the economy faces. To sort of sum up what Cornelius was saying in terms of the difficulties and the bottlenecks, you know, you, you take the fiscal side and the country is in an unsustainable situation that it's going to have to fix. You take um, tax reform, it has to be done because it's just hugely onerous on the country and it just prevents productivity from picking up. Um, you take, you know, trade, which Brazil has largely not done really over the past almost 40 years. The country is essentially one of the most closed economies in the world and nothing's been done to change that situation. Um, and then, you know, you take also all of the, the series of microeconomic reforms that some of which the current government has been trying to do, but it's basically these reforms to make the business environment more friendly. The business environment in Brazil is notoriously unfriendly. When you put all that in a, on a plate and you sort of mix it up and you try to come up with a number, um, it gives you a, 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 a number for what the potential growth of Brazil is that is really low. So. Ten years ago, around right before the financial crisis, you had a number of analysts in Brazil, myself included, calculating potential growth because it seemed as if the country was poised to really take off. So you had some, some people estimating that potential growth in Brazil was somewhere in the realm of 4.5%. I wasn't ever quite that optimistic, but my number was somewhere around 3.5, um, which is not spectacular, but it's not negligible either, and it seemed, it seemed reasonable enough. Ten years on from, from that point in time, if you do any calculation, any reasonable calculation to try to get at what potential growth is in Brazil right now, you don't get past one and a half. 
So in 10 years, we've gone from, you know, three and a half, four and a half percent potential growth, that is medium term um, potential for the country, to just one and a half. So that gives you a sense of how important these reforms are and how really the country has to move fast. Because if we are indeed at this point where we're going to start seeing an intensification of the current cyclical recovery um, without fixing some of the underlying fiscal problems, without addressing some of the underlying um, structural issues, Obviously, what's going to happen is that at some point, not right now, not necessarily this year, but at some point, inflation is going to come back. Um, and this, this, is, this is something that obviously it, it hurts very much the population, especially, especially the, poor, the poorest part or the, the, the people who have less ability to defend themselves against inflation. So we haven't, although Brazil has gone through you know, what seems to have been a period right now over the last year or so of you know, an intensification of reforms, trying to fix the problems that were in place and that were actually aggravated by the pre, the pre Previous government, the government of Dilma Rousseff, um, not much really, not much progress has really been made. And all of these issues, inflation, low growth, low productivity, investment ratios which are low and which also point to this very difficult scenario going forward, all of these things are going to have to be done. Now when you, when, you, when you look at that and you sort of think, okay, so they all need to be done, they all need to be done rather quickly, that means 2019 at this stage because the current government obviously isn't going to be able to do anything else, we've seen it already with the pension reform that's been buried. And then we get to 2019 and we sort of think, okay, regardless of which government is in place at that point, so not getting into which specific candidate wins the election, the problem is going to be that that candidate is going to be working with a, a very fragmented Congress, as Professor Rowett was saying. This, is, this isn't likely to change. I mean, Brazil put in place a partial political reform last year, at the end of last year, which um, introduces election thresholds for political parties. But they're, they're, pretty, they're supposed to go up over time. They're very small right now. So they're not likely to really influence the composition of Congress um, come elections. On top of that, you have the issue of Lava Jato and the corruption scandal and the investigations and how that has affected PMDB, PSGB, PT, the three major parties. Um, so yes, the party machinery is still in place. The way that elections function in Brazil is, hasn't really changed. However, those parties are coming under increased pressure and you know, it kind of, that sort of situation sort of lends itself to thinking, okay, perhaps Congress will be best case just as fragmented as it is right now. Um, but there is, you know, a chance that it might be slightly more fragmented than it is right now. And then, and then you look at that kind of situation and you think, how are reforms going to get done in that context unless there's some kind of market pressure? Um, so the way that things seem to be playing out, at least, you know, from looking at them right now, and we're probably going to have another event like this later in the year once we have a, a more clarity on, on, the, on the political scenarios. But so far, when you look at 2019, the situation is not auspicious. And, and the only thing really that seems to be a driver for reform is going to be market turbulence and you know, the sort of thing that we saw, maybe not with the same intensity, but the sort of thing that we saw back in 2015. So if, if that's what's happening, and if you put that together now with the external scenario, so far the external environment has been very benign for Brazil. As as it has been for all emerging markets. Um, but that's, that's kind of starting to change. I mean, most, most um, people still view global growth as being sound. Um, everything seems to be moving in, in a good direction. But we've just seen the kind of protectionism that the world might have to be dealing with in come 2019 um, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the sort of proposals that are coming out of the US administration. On top of that, you have also, in the, in the case of the US, you have an economy that is, at the moment, expanding with a huge fiscal stimulus on top of it. So you have a lot of um, a lot of demand pressures, which are likely to perhaps pull, push inflation up a bit in the U.S., which will lead to interest rates increasing at a time when Brazil is going to be vulnerable and the new administration is going to be coming in. So that's certainly not favorable 
um, for the country as a whole and for the continuation of the recovery as a whole. And then you have these other protectionist forces, which will also be damaging to, to, to a large extent, especially in the case of Brazil, which is a steel exporter and exports a lot of steel to the US. Um, so you know, unless there are exemptions given, and so far we don't know if there will be, but Brazil will certainly be affected by that. So on the external front, there isn't much for Brazil in 2019, if anything, and there are likely to be headwinds even in 2019. So when you put all of that together and you try to fit all that together into a picture, the picture doesn't look very good. So it might look okay right now, but as you get closer and closer to 2019, it kind of fades away. You know, the sort of euphoria, the sort of dynamism that people um, are seeing right now, this seems to, you know, it, it looks to me like that's sort of going to fade away as time goes by. And then, you, and then you look at the candidates, you know, and you look at the election and you look at the climate, the political climate in Brazil right now. The political climate in Brazil right now is one of extreme polarization, one of, you know, just people fighting with each other on social media all the time um, over, you know, I like this candidate, I like that candidate, and some people defending the indefensible. Um, and, and that, of course, has, the, the, the connotation of that for the elections are very bad. Um, when we look at sort of what are, what, what are the likely outcomes, we've spoken a bit of the candidates and you know, what, what, the, what, some, what, what might happen and which candidates might actually emerge. But one thing that will probably happen, because we already saw it happen in 2016 in the municipal elections, is that these elections are going to have a huge, the elections themselves are going to have a huge rejection rate, like the municipal elections in 2016. In 2016, we saw a, a just, just, just about 40% of blank and null votes. Voting in Brazil is compulsory. Everybody has to vote. Um, so those people who feel like they they're, they have nobody to choose. They just, you know, vote blank or they nullify their votes. And we saw practically 40% uh, of that happening in, in, in 2016. The poll that just came out, there was a poll that just came out yesterday, which is very telling about these sorts of trends for the October 2018 elections. In every single scenario that was done, either for the first round or for the runoff, the null and blank votes together amounted to anywhere between 45 and 55 percent. So if this is what actually materializes in October of 2018, whoever gets elected, whether it's Bolsonaro, hopefully not, or somebody else, the issue is that that person is going to be elected on a very narrow margin of votes, and that with the, having that narrow vote, narrow uh, margin of votes, with the kind of reforms that they will have to do, facing a possibly very negative external scenario is certainly not an equation that's easy to get your head around. Um, so when you put all of these things together, you know the picture really doesn't look very, very, very good at, at all. And this is without saying anything about the candidates themselves. Just to make one final point about the candidates themselves, I was this morning at the at the event over at the Wilson Center where the governor of Sao Paulo, Geraldo Alckmin, was um, was was speaking. Um, he, of course, you know, said all the right things, made all the right noises about the the, the reforms that that. Brazil needs and the kinds of things that Brazil needs to do, um, but you know he's speaking at that at that um, particular event. He's speaking to a knowledgeable audience of people who understand these things and who know the necessity of doing them. Now try to getting that and putting that in the context of you know Brazil as it is right now. Nobody <clears throat> wants to hear the talk of reforms, um, and nobody wants to hear the talk of reforms because there is this huge polarization and tension in the country because the reforms haven't been done by the Temer government, and a lot of people don't like the Temer government. The Temer government, I think, is the one government that has managed the unthinkable. The approval rating that Temer has um, depending on which segment of the population you look at, is sort of reaching zero. You know, it's trending mm -hmm. towards zero. Um, so that makes, so, and the reforms have very much been associated with him. So 
that has made the topic of pension reform itself extremely toxic. Um, so again, you know, just to drive home this point one more time, whoever comes in is going to have a toxic agenda to push through in an environment that's not going to be very welcoming or very friendly at all with the Congress that's going to be highly fragmented. So the pieces don't really fit. And I'll end there. <laughs> On that optimistic note, I will give you a trivia question, then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, why did Vice President Pence and why did Secretary of State Tillerson not visit Brazil on their trips to South America? We're now open for questions. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody has the answer, please let me know. I've been trying to find out for a no <laughs> Ah, Bettina now says there's no wall to be built. Any questions, comments, speeches, please? Wait to the microphone, as they say in the movies. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, I have a question for you, Dr. DeBull. Um, so the very last sentence you said was, it's not going to go so well, given all the conditions that somebody's going to come into. How do you see that playing out over the course of 5, 10, 20 years, and how would you fix that? That's a tough question, 5, 10, 20 years. Let me stick to five. Um, um, over the course, so what I, see, what I see happening in Brazil largely is that somebody's going to come in, they're going to face all of these problems, we're going to have another episode of market turbulence that may last for a while, um, we might have another mini crisis, and then eventually, you know, Congress and, and the executive are going to be pushed into doing something. It, it, it's going to be the same scenario that Brazil always faces. You know, you, 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 you go through, you, you face the problem, markets push you, then you feel like you have to do something and you have to do something fast because otherwise, you know, the country is going to dip into recession again or it has already dipped into recession and dipping into recession after having just come out of a very deep recession is a no-no. So then you really have to get something done. But that's something that you actually end up doing is not enough to solve the underlying structural problem. Problems. So you sort of kick the can once again. Um, this, is, this is how I sort of see things playing out, at least right now. Um, it's hard to say much more than that for the next five years because the country is undergoing a lot of changes at the moment. There's lots of stuff happening at the same time. So on the political front, we don't know what's going to happen in five years' time. What is the political system in Brazil going to look like? I mean, we know that for the next election, you know, things are not likely to change all that much. But there's been, on the upside, just to say some positive things, given that I've said a lot of negative things, um, on the positive side of this equation is the fact that we have seen in Brazil something that we'd never really seen before, which is the, the uprising of some grassroots movement. Now, the political system in Brazil functions in a way that doesn't really allow you know, doors for these it, the, these, these potential people, you know, who are in these movements to actually run for office. You need, you need a party to be able to run for office. You can't run as an independent. You know, all, there, there are lots of difficulties and lots of obstacles along the way. However, if the current sort of pressure that we've seen and the current rejection of politics as it's always been in Brazil gets, you know, it, continues, if, if this momentum doesn't die, I think what we're looking at is a situation where five years from now, we might be looking at a very, very different situation. And we might be looking at very different, a very different p political landscape in a very different scenario. So that's the, that's the optimistic <clears throat> case, I think, um, to, make, to make for Brazil. On the economy, over, the, over the, the, the coming period, at least over the next two years, it's like I said, it's pretty much an attempt at muddling through with market turbulence in the way, because that's the only thing that's going to push the system. Think of the implications. That's the first time since the 1988 Constitution uh, was promulgated that the federal government sent federal troops into Rio de Janeiro to take over the police and the security forces for the first time since 1988. That is an amazing statement, in part because Rio de Janeiro is broke fiscally. It's been badly managed. But it isn't just Rio de Janeiro that's teetering at the edge. There are other states in the Federation as well that are near bankruptcy. So the federal government at some time 
in 2019, 2020, will need to begin to face up to that fact that individual states and municipalities have no money. They can't pay the police. Now, if you can't pay the police, you have a serious security problem on your hands. And that is true in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and that is true in other cities as well. So I think we will, are looking at a possible period of increasing discontent uh, on the part of the citizens of Brazil, primarily in the big cities, and there's no easy answer for that, unfortunately. Can you raise any comment? Um, no, but I wanted to quickly comment actually on one of the, the questions you had posed at the beginning, mm -hmm. um, which is why was the government not able to, to pass the pension reform? And I guess also related to that, what, what can any new government do better? Um, I think that's a very interesting question because if you look at the, the Brazilian pension system as it is, um, it's not only overly expensive, it's also very unfair. Yes. Um, and it's very unfair because those who really receive sort of subsidies or net benefits or who get more out than they, than they pay in in contributions are um, private sector workers and among those, mostly those who are able to get a, a good formal sector job early in life um, who are able to keep it for 30 years and are then able to retire, you know, in their, in their 50s, essentially. Um, which tends to be people who, you know, who are not poor, who are sort of well off to begin with, who went to good schools and got the good job um, early on in life. Um, so those people are the ones receiving about 35% the top, the top 20% of Brazilians um, receive about 35% of those net subsidies. And the reform that was proposed, and really any, any reform that is being proposed, um, would primarily cut down those benefits by forcing people to actually work until the retirement age, um, which um, is already 65 for men, it's 60 for women, and you know, it would have been binding 65 for men, and then it was gonna be 65 for women, then they lowered it to 62, so a little bit of increase there. Um, and then the other group that really benefits a lot from the current system is the, the public sector workers who are in a, in a completely separate system and where they just you know, similarly can retire you know, very early in life at very high benefits, receiving huge um, subsidies. And where are those subsidies coming from? They're coming from the taxpayer. And the taxpayer in Brazil is mostly the sort of poor, working poor middle class um, because Brazil taxes consumption much more than it taxes income or wealth. Um, so the sort of the, the effective tax rate for the, for the top 10% or even more the top 1% is, is actually quite low, um, whereas for people more in the middle and towards the bottom of the, of the income distribution, you know, they end up paying taxes on, on everything they buy every day. Um, so really, a tax reform could have been, should have been popular in a sense, right? Because it, it reduces the privileges of the, of the rich and then, you know, enables the government to actually take care of the, the things that it should be taking care of, public education, security, etc. Um, of course, this is very difficult to, to communicate. I think pension reforms are always unpopular. People are always worried that, you know, they're going to be, um, have their, their benefits taken away. Um, I think the fact that this government um, has a very low approval rating and popularity um, was a, an important factor. Um, so I'm a little bit optimistic maybe that, you know, whoever gets elected, even if the election um, is, is in the way that Dr. Bola described it, they're not going to have an approval rating as low as the, the current government. Yeah. Um, I think if it's not. somebody yeah. who's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty much impossible. So I think if it's somebody maybe a little bit more in the, in the central part of the political spectrum, which I guess could be Geraldo Alckmin or Marina mm -hmm. Silva, um, you know, they might actually have an okay approval rating and might be better able to, to communicate um, the need for the reform and, and how the reform actually affects people. Yeah, this is a crucial point. Um, the current government was terrible at communicating the need for pension reform. It's also, you know, the fact that it is the it was the PMDB pushing for pension reform. The PMDB, who was also involved in Lava Jato, you know, that kind of perception impedes any sort of communication, right? Um, so that didn't help things along very much. So I agree with Cornelius, you know, the next um, administration, if it's, a, if it's a sensible one, if it's a reasonable one, they might have a better chance. It would be easier, in a sense, it would be a lot easier 
if they were to do this in the context of speaking clearly about income inequality in Brazil, which Cornelius also mentioned. So there is this you know, myth out there that we've seen for many years that Brazil was great at reducing income inequality and it achieved this incredible feat of you know, just over the, the, the past 16 years or so of really, really um, helping you know, the bottom of the income distribution to rise. Um, that story is partially true. Certainly it's, it's true with respect to poverty. But if you look at inequality in terms, in, in, in a broader sense, so if you look at inequality taking into account the regressive tax structure that Brazil has, if you look at it when you, when you sort of combine, you know, household surveys where you have salaries and wages, which is what mostly people look at when they're looking at income inequality, but you combine that with a sort of PKT approach where, you know, you look at tax payments as well and what, what sort of burden people are facing. Um, when you do that kind of analysis, what you really see is that income inequality did fall in Brazil between sort of 2000 and maybe 2006, 2007, but since then, it's basically been stagnant. And the main reason for that has to do precisely with this regressive, regressive tax structure that Brazil has. So to really be able to drive all of these points home and to explain to people what the issues really are, you have to tell them a story about their lives. You, know, you have to talk to them about inequality, the inequalities that they face, why they face such hard access for getting good public services, why you know, the, 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 the state is so stretched in terms of its resources, and put pension reform in that context, and put tax reform in that context. Unless you do it that way, it's gonna be very hard to really get the message across to people, because Brazilians are absolutely disenchanted with their, govern with their governing class, with their governing elites. They see everybody as corrupt. They believe that everybody's in it to you know, get some money out of it in some way, and that will still be the case in these elections in 2018 all the more so because of all the things that we've seen playing out. So the next government really needs to have that kind of communicating ability. This is where uh, 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 a person like Jair Bolsonaro can be particularly toxic. And, and here's where the, the danger lies. Because he is not someone who is well versed in economics at all. Um, he's also not somebody who has any real convictions. I mean, if you look at the kind of things that he said in the past with respect to his views about the economy, he thought that things were great under the military dictatorship, especially in the 70s, when the state was hugely interventionist in the economy, um, much more so than Dilma ever was, and basically distorted a lot of things by being that way. That's, that's been sort of his view for a very long time. Recently, he's been trying to portray himself as a liberal in the, in the non-American sense. So he's been trying to portray himself as a free market guy who is gonna be fighting for you know, a small state. And then, and then you kind of think about that and you think to yourself, you know, small state? What does that mean in the context of a country that needs so many social programs that need that has such high inequality and that you know needs to do so many things yes there are lots of inefficiencies as Cornelius was saying so there's a there's an issue to be addressed here in terms of you know all of all of the problems the 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 that that the, that the Brazilian state has. So there has to be a reform of the state. But talking about minimal state, what kind of sense does that make? So Bolsonaro has currently associated himself with someone who has a PhD from the University of Chicago. So it's not surprising in some ways that he's having that kind of discourse. And he's trying to become the sort of market friendly person um, with this sort of discourse. But the, the danger is that if you get somebody like that in the presidency, who knows what might happen? Because certainly his concern is not going to be, let's galvanize the country, let's try to get these reforms through, and let's try to do this in a way that's actually speaking to people as they see their lives. It's, it's certainly not going to be that kind of discourse. So this is, I think, the, um, the real challenge and the real problem that Brazil is facing with the risk of having a candidate like that being elected. We worry about that every day in Washington. 
Um, <laughs> let me give you one number. Uh, as my students know, I often refer to the World Economic Forum report on competitiveness. Uh, this year, out of 137 countries, they ranked 137 countries, in terms of public trust in politicians, Brazil ranked 137. <laughs> you can imagine the difficult problem of attempting to build a coalition that the people would actually trust to get anything done. And first. Second, the issue of health and education is very important. You know, malnutrition workers are not productive. Children who can't actually do science and math are not going to rise up in the country. And the politicians don't seem to really care. And the education system is really in favor of the well-to-do. If you go to a bad, private, uh, bad public school and a bad public high school, you can't pass the examination to get into the very good public universities. And nobody in their right mind goes to a public clinic in Brazil. Poor people can't afford the cost of private clinics. The middle class and upper middle class can. So this is another aspect of the inequalities in Brazil that have lasted for decades, if not centuries. You know, the lack of responsibility on the part of the governing class for the majority of the population. And it's not even a matter of spending, because when you look at spending in education, for example, it's somewhere in the realm of 5 to 6 percent of GDP. It's comparable to spending on education in OECD countries, in many OECD countries. It's just that it's very badly spent money, and some of it just disappears, just disappears yeah. into a black hole. Or into pensions. Or into pensions. <laughs> Other questions? Bettina, Professor Boki. Yeah, whatever. It is for you. <laughs> um, I just want to add on the education part um, that uh, especially higher education is incredible. Like the spending on higher education is above OECD average. So yeah. if we look at that, that means what does go to primary and secondary edu public education is embarrassing, pretty much. Um, question for whomever wants to... Um, opine on the panel. Um, will people be going to the streets again after the elections or like in January next year? Is it going to be that boiled up? We don't know what the level of tension is going to be because we'll only know who the candidates are on April 7. That's the deadline for candidates to be affiliated with the political party. Then we'll know kind of the landscape of candidates at least. Uh, the, people are in a very short fuse in Brazil at the present time. Uh, they're angry, they're disappointed, uh, they're furious, uh, they're in disbelief that the corruption charges keep coming out and coming out and coming out and coming out and don't seem to end. And the corruption charges are linked, of course, to what? To billions of dollars that were stolen, stolen by corrupt construction company folks and politicians. Everyone knows this. It is not a, it, we're not talking about millions. We're talking about billions. So if you're a person who can't afford to send your kid to a private school, and you know that most of the members of Congress send their children to private school, of course, and they can go to private hospitals as well, you are becoming very, very furious. And you probably, if you are in class C, lower middle class in Brazil, you probably are falling out or have fallen out because of the recession the last couple of years. And where do you go? You know, when it was good times with Bolsa Familia, the family package, you bought a car, you bought an apartment, you bought white, white goods, you now have to pay them back and you've got to find some way to pay them back. And that is facing so many Class C families in Brazil today, they don't have any hope. And we know from history that when a population loses hope, they can do very, very damaging things to society. And we're all very fearful that will happen. We hope it won't, uh, but the political, political action of the past couple of years indicates Brazilians are now at the edge of their tolerance for the politicians. The big question is, of course, in a country as large as Brazil, with as many competent people uh, as there are in it, why are the politicians so bad? And that's another qu trivia question, you know, but it is true. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've spent a lot of time in the Brazilian Congress, and I've spent a lot of time talking to local politicians. They don't want to talk about policy. They're not interested. I remember an interview I had years ago with the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee uh, in the Senate. And I, I've got what I asked him, some very general question about European Union, I don't know what it was. And he said, meu filho, my son, uh, let's talk about my home state, Paraíba. I understand you're from the northeast of Brazil. And I said, uh, Mr. Chairman, 
Senor, I'd like to talk about the foreign policy issues. He had absolutely no idea or clue or interest in talking about foreign policy. He was the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. And it's unfortunately, I say constantly, don't try to get a ticket out of Brasilia on a plane on Thursday night because they're all taken. And don't try to get back on Monday morning because they're all coming back from their constituencies as well. And these are free trips, by the way, uh, for politicians. Uh, and so it's those structural issues that are now becoming increasingly known and are galling to the average person who is out there trying to get a job or working a very bad job uh, long periods of time. Uh, and that at some point there has to become a meeting point between frustration, anger, and the responsibilities of public officials. And I don't see that coming in the short term. Because if we sat here 2019, we probably would still be talking about 26 or more political parties in the lower house, yep. people showing up to run, and it's a very strange election system, we need to go into the details, or yeah, 16 parties in the Senate. Some of those parties have one or two members. And in a presidential multi-party system, the way in which you get legislation passed is by bargaining day by day with the parties in the system. And why do you think the ministries change so often? Because party leaders want ministries, because ministries provide money money to go to their constituencies. And there's a famous, not famous, but a well-known word in Brazil, ministeriável. Every politician wants to be a minister. Because it isn't just the minister, the outgoing minister that is replaced, it's the vice minister, it's the chief of staff, it is X, Y, Z, A, B, C, and you can appoint all of your own people. So you get in there for 12, 14 months, and then it's your time to rotate out, and somebody else takes your place, and the same thing, the same thing happens. But just think. If, the White House had to deal with, they can't deal with two parties, but if they had to deal with 26 parties on a daily basis, how do you make public policy? I mean, the reason the, the fiscal reform didn't pass, they got to about 250 maybe votes in the lower house, and you needed 308. They obviously couldn't buy the other votes they needed or couldn't persuade people to move over because they were afraid of the electoral result if they did. And so this is going to be a lost year in terms of reform, as Monica can tell us, there are a lot of micro-reforms they're considering, but the big reforms are just not on the table. Yeah. Other questions? Hi, good evening. Hello, Thank you for the presentations. I'm a Brazil enthusiast, so it was sad for me to see, to, to listen to you in this somber forecast of Brazil. And it made me think, I follow energy markets. How is that Exxon decided to invest or promised to invest $2 billion in Brazil? and it did not so in Mexico. If you compare the political climate in Mexico seems to be less polarized, relatively speaking, to Brazil. And you see Brookfield wanting to acquire assets, and you see Total acquiring assets. These people play the long run horizon. Are they more optimistic because they see something different in Brazil than we? Or are they not well informed that's the question that goes into my mind. No, I think, I think they're very well informed. I will not second guess them um, any, any, any day. Um, what I do think, though, is we're talking about the aggregate picture when we say these things. But of course, Brazil has pockets of excellence, just, just as any country does. And in the energy sector, what we have seen, and this is something positive to be said about, about this government, is that after the, the, you know, the, the whole mess with Petrobras, they did put somebody in charge of Petrobras and they, put, they, they did, you know, on the board of Petrobras, put in place a number of excellent people who were able to turn the company around. And Brazil has huge energy potential. So, you know, on, on that side of things, um, that, that is one pocket. It was in the past before Petrobras was run to the ground. It was a pocket of excellence that was, you know, stolen from, um, it's now starting to rise up as a pocket of excellence again. So I think that explains, you know, why you see some investors moving back into the energy sector in Brazil, since things have been cleaned up. Some of the legislation that the Rousseff government has put in place has been reversed, and they've gone back to the previous system, which was more favorable to investment in the energy sector. So things were done that have actually galvanized investment in that particular sector. Agribusiness, despite 
the potholes, despite the infrastructure problem, despite the fact that 40% of agricultural production gets lost along the way as trucks go to the ports, and this is an actual number. Um, the agribusiness sector in Brazil is extremely dynamic and competitive. Um, and as Cornelius was saying, is what pulled the economy out of recession last year. So, you know, in, 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 when, we, when we speak of agribusiness, we're speaking of a host of different activities. It's not just, you know, the, the production of soybeans or the production of corn or grains or, you know, it's also food processing. It's also a lot of other um, industry chains that are connected to this sector. So evidently there are a lot of investors out there who see this kind kind of potential and who will invest. So Brazil is going to continue to attract investment. And if we look at the trends, actually, and if we look at what's happened to you know, the long-term view on Brazil and the foreign direct investment view, um, even in, during the worst of the political crisis in Brazil, um, back in 2015, 2016, when there was you know, the whole thing about the impeachment, was it going to happen, was it not going to happen, FDI continued coming in. It never really dropped off. Par particular because Brazil does have these pockets of excellence, like Mexico. Mexico mm -hmm. has its own pockets of excellence. So I think that's that's what it, what explains that part of the story. Now, when you try to you know look at the bigger picture, is when you have the problem because with the bigger picture in play is where you see okay, but the problems in other sectors of the economy are really pretty massive. Um, think of manufacturing in Brazil. Manufacturing in Brazil has been dying slowly, has been dying a slow death, and this is, of course, a common theme um, in many different parts of the world, um, including in this country. Um, manufacturing has been dying a slow death for a very long time. In the case of Brazil, manufacturing has been dying a slow death simply because it's a very uncompetitive sector. It has nothing to offer. It's, you know, very, very... Um, it just lacks competitiveness. You know, the, 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 there's no insertion into, into global value chains. Brazil, actually, there's a very good, and, and we don't have any charts here, but the OECD just produced a survey um, of, of Brazil, and there's a chart in the segment where they talk about trade, there's a chart that tries to map out global value chains. And so you see, you know, for people who took my financial crisis class, you'll be familiar with that kind of chart because it's a bunch of dots and then a bunch of different connections and you can see the networks. Um, and then you see, you know, Brazil is this isolated green dot with all this white paper around it, no connections to anybody except Argentina, who is also a lost green dot in this one piece of paper, the two connected to each other and not connected to anybody else. Um, so this is the sort of thing that, you know, really, when, when you look at that and when you tie it into all the other things that, that we've said on this panel, it doesn't leave you very optimistic um, with respect to the country as a whole going forward, which is not to say that some sectors in the economy won't be doing well just the same or won't be doing much, much better than the average. And Brazil avoids uh, global value chains. Remember, they were, they were not involved in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. They obviously are not part of the Pacific Alliance. They're sort of stuck in the South Atlantic, and they really don't know what to do about that. And so what they do is they close the economy more and more to protect themselves. Because they dare open the economy, firms will die, jobs will be lost. And the political implications of that are very, very serious, obviously, in a polarized society and an un unequal society like Brazil. Yeah. Um, just quickly on the, the question of the, I guess, the commodity sector. Um, I think this is very important to sort of explain the dichotomy that we're seeing right now with, you know, us um, being kind of gloomy and saying the politics is, is a mess and the fiscal situation is bad and, and unresolved. And the, the market's actually being very, very optimistic. Um, I think the Brazilian stock market is still pretty much at the highest it's ever been. And, but I think it's important to remember that the, the Brazilian stock market and sort of also the currency tends to be very strongly linked to, to commodity markets, commodity developments. Um, but the Brazilian economy, even though, of course, Brazil is a major commodity exporter, is not really that much of a commodity-driven economy. Um, just to give you an idea, agriculture grew 13% last year. Um, the extractive industries grew um, somewhere around 4 or 5%. 
And that only got GDP growing 1%, right? Because those sectors are actually quite small in the Brazilian economy. So I think what Professor Debolo described is, yes, the, those sectors are doing well, but they're, you know, they're somewhat disconnected from the wider economy. Um, and you know, the wider economy can, can do poorly, and the stock market might still be at records high. <laughs> Zero. Yeah. John? May I ask uh, a question? question? Oh. Good evening. Good Thank evening. you for your remarks. I wasn't here uh, in the beginning, so I hope you haven't covered this, but my question is uh, really simple and is uh, related with the PT and Lula. And I was curious to hear your remarks. If, so if we see that uh, Lula is convicted or fails to win the election, will we see this at uh, the end of the PT? Will we see this the death as the death of the party? Political parties never die in Brazil. <laughs> they they just go home to rest for a while uh, and then come back out. Uh, it's very, I mean, you and I could go to Brazil and within a year or two uh, have a political party recognized by the Federal Electoral Tribunal. Uh, while there are 26 parties in Congress, there are many more parties that have been recognized. Uh, and they have a local base or a state base or a municipal base, <clears throat> and they really can't compete nationally, but they exist. And I, w I think we'll probably see more than 26 parties going into the next Congress because of the splintered nature of the political system uh, and the very peculiar uh, electoral system that Brazil has. And just think again, this is a, you know, a presidential multi-party system, which means the president on a daily basis, which is the reason Dilma Rousseff was impeached in large part, on a daily basis must make deals. You know, pork has to be shoveled out. Jobs must be made available in the federal bureaucracy, at, in, either in Brasilia or at the state or municipal level. That is what makes the system so terribly rancid, but it also is what makes the system function or dysfunction, depending yeah. on the word you'd like to use. And to change that culture, and it's part of the culture, to change that culture in Brazil is a tremendous challenge because somebody has to take the lead. And although the, you know, we, the Congress could vote to reduce the number of political parties to five, but then what happens to the other 21 political parties? Are they going to vote themselves out of a, a, a job? Of course not. And so the, it just perpetuates itself. Every four years, the cycle just goes all around and around. You get some new faces, but you get a lot of old faces. Some people change political parties fairly frequently. As I said, Pseudo Gomez has been in seven political parties. Um, they've all moved. Bolsonaro has most, been in nine. Then nine political parties. And parties don't have any ideology. They don't have any program. They're basically electoral mechanisms to get you into Brasilia so you can basically go to the trough. And the pigs are at the trough all day long uh, in Brasilia. And that's why we have the federal budget deficit as we have, because so much is spent on nonsensical roads that go nowhere, bridges that go nowhere. Um, because if you build a bridge as, as a governor and you're out of office in four years, your successor is going to want to build his own bridge or his own road. <laughs> and they forget, always forget to put money in the in the budget for maintenance. For, that's why the roads are so terrible. No one maintains them. That's why things are always falling down, like in the United States, because they're not maintained. Uh, and that is a critical problem, a development challenge uh, for any country, including the United States. And we're not particularly productive or competitive either uh, anymore. Is your final question before we break? Yes, ma'am. Here comes Michael. Unfortunately, I don't have an answer to your question about the State Department, even though I work there, I'm ashamed to say. I so I'll look into that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I do have a question about the military and just going back to particularly the militarization of, of this security response and law enforcement response really in Rio and the implications that that might have going forward. I know the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights issued a statement today already expressing concern about this decision. and you know, looking forward to responses to, as you were mentioning, protests or just any sort of public demonstrations that might occur in the next several months. Is that, is that a concern? Is that something that we should be thinking about? Or historically, no, I guess is my question. Well, the breakdown of law and order is a very serious uh, political challenge. And this is the first, the government has sent military forces at times, but never to take over the state. And this is a new precedent. We don't know where it's going to go. You know, what happens? What happens if it, uh, this kind of situation breaks out in X state? Will the Planalto, the presidential palace, you know, call the military and send, send in troops to this state? And then suddenly you begin to militarize Brazil, and nobody wants to go back to the military dictatorship. But many people feel uh, a military presence in the short term will probably make a difference, but it doesn't get at the underlying problems of poverty, no money, 
and mendaciousness on the part of the local politicians. That is my, my deep concern about trying to resolve this issue institutionally. Yeah, and in the case of Rio, um, which is my home state, and the city of Rio, which is my hometown, um, the problem, and this, this, is, this is a wider problem in Brazil that's gone unrecognized for a very long time, and now the government's having to deal with it. Brazil is now, well, well Rio is now um, the, the sort of, the place where you have, it, it, it's like a mini Bogota um, when you look at it these days, you know, what Bogota was in the 1980s. You have all of these drug gangs which are competing for territory. Um, the reason why we don't see the same thing in Sao Paulo is because Sao Paulo is basically overtaken by one drug gang. So you don't have the same kind of infighting that you have in Rio. But it's, it's pretty much that. And, and the reason why the military had to be called in is because there was an or orchestrated movement by some of these drug gangs, which are trying to get turf from some other drug gangs, to invade the streets of Zona Sul in the center of Rio. So this military intervention that was put together just recently, um, it was put together very last minute because they learned of this intelligence and then basically they just, boom, had to send the army in um, to contain this. And this is this is re this is a reflection of the complete breakdown in law in, in law and order essentially <laughs> that plagues the country right now. Rio is sort of the the picture of wh what the rest of Brazil might look like, and that's the scary part. And going back to what Professor Roet said and, and Cornelius was saying as well, um, the states are bankrupt. Um, there's a real you know subnational. Um, fiscal problem too, which the federal government's not going to be able to resolve. So that adds another layer of uncertainty to already a very complicated story that we've been discussing here. And yeah, the military can you know provide some sense of security for some time, but obviously at some point you're going to have to take them out of the picture. And then what do you put in place? I mean, certainly there's no solution for the next six months. The military is supposed to be in place in Brazil until, in Rio, until the end of, the end of December. What happens after that? You know, they get out and then, and then what? Um, so this is really the problem, I think. This is really the issue. Um, <clears throat> more than um, demonstrations and other things that might very well happen, there's a, there's a bigger sort of law and order issue to do with these drug gangs that really hasn't been addressed at all by any government at the local level or at the federal level that needs to be looked at. And just to say a final word on Lula to Miguel, um, I think that this is my own opinion of Lula right now. I think Lula is playing a very interesting game. I think he knows that he's not going to be a, a candidate. Um, given the way that the rulings have gone against him. Um, however, he is staying in the game for now because he is trying to promote someone else. We don't know who that someone else is going to be. I don't think even, you know, the, the, the PT has a very good idea. They have, you know, Fernando Haddad, who was the mayor of Sao Paulo, but he doesn't look like he's going anywhere. Um, but Lula wants to stay in the game, you know, at least to be a disruptive factor and to keep his brand. Because remember, he's got to keep his legacy. For a certain portion of the Brazilian population, Lula is always going to be Lula. And as long as he's in the game and he can somehow say, I'm being a victim of the system, which is pretty much the card that he's playing right now and that he's going to continue to be playing, he's still going to be a political force to reckon with, even if he's not on the ballot come October, and even if, you know, the country moves to a centrist candidate, Lula is still going to be there as an irritant to the system. He's not going away. And if he goes to jail, he's a martyr. Yeah. And um, his followers will be in the streets. Yeah. And what that, what that represents in terms of law and order, we just don't know. Now, this is an un unprecedented situation in Brazil at the present time, because Lula is still Lula. Uh, not the popularity that he had when he was in office, but he's still very popular. And there is this class issue that many people in the lower class truly believe the elites are doing this deliberately because they don't want a little fat worker uh, who was a very successful president to come back because the PT for many people in the middle class uh, is something you don't want to talk about anymore given the fact that they presided over the Lava Jato beginnings and the Petrobras scandal. So the country is so polarized, and Lula knows that, and he's playing on it. Uh, and the PT is playing on it as well. 
that is usustema, the system is out to get Lula, uh, is the message. And that is a very dangerous message. If indeed it does wind up in jail, we don't know what's going to happen. Some PT have been quoted as saying, we'll go to the jail and get him out, <laughs> which is a bit of hyperbole, but that's the sentiment among many people now in, in Brazil, unfortunately. But on that happy note, let's end. Let me thank the panel, and please join us for a reception in back. <laughs>